Okay. Morning, everyone. I want to start um, today's proceedings with uh, a trans poet, Meg Day. And they begin their poem in a way that I love because my wonderful colonial training has pushed John Donne into my head. And the beginning of, her poem, of their poem is, Batter my heart, transgendered God, for yours is the only ear that hears. And I thought that was a wonderful take on John Donne's Batter my heart, three-personed God. So to begin with that, good morning to everyone here in Reykjavik. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. Yesterday, Elin tells me there were 300 people online watching um, and listening in. Um, and welcome to the second half of the conference. As I lead you into panel four, I'd like to remind you that speaker addresses for this session by Jane Townsley and Vrinda Grover are available on the platform and online, and we hope that you've had a chance to listen in or watch them. We thought it fitting to end the panel discussions with a session on revitalizing traditional justice systems. Decades of feminist work have built a system of due process which survivors can access. Yet in recent years, it, years, it's become clear that this system has either failed or been unresponsive to the needs of survivors. What has been done to correct these gaps and failures of the traditional justice system? How can the law and its processes be changed, modified, or otherwise reinvigorated so as to continue to be relevant to the ongoing endeavor to respond to the global crisis of gender-based violence? This panel spotlights efforts being made in this regard by the state, NGOs, legal practitioners who have helped change the system, and activists and academics holding the system accountable. Our panelists for this session are Jane Townsley, Maria Shab Audnadotir, Marianne Franks, Sigurdur Björk Gudjonsdotir, Stina Holmberg, Viedis Eva Gudmundsdotir, and Vrinda Grover. Our panel chair is Maria Rune Bjartnadotir, who is director for internet safety at the Icelandic National and the Icelandic National Commissioner for Police, and adjunct professor at the University of Akureyri, where she convenes modules on cybercrime, violence, and power relations. Maria is the vice chair of the Icelandic Media Commission, the chair and gender rapporteur of the Council of Europe Expert Committee on Combating Hate Speech co-founder of the Nordic Digital Rights and Equality Foundations, and sits on the board of the Nordic Privacy Center. She represents Icelandic authorities in the Council of Europe Steering Committee on Anti-Discrimination, Diversity, and Inclusion. So I can't think of more capable hands to guide us through this complex terrain. And before I do that, a quick reminder that you can submit questions via slido, sli.do, which is uh, available with the virtual platform. And if you're using the app, use the hashtag 704730. Also, all the sessions from yesterday are actually available on um, the virtual platform um, and on the webpage and will be available on YouTube very soon. Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I see we already have uh, our online panelists uh, with us, which is great. It's amazing what technology can do um, and help us um, in these times. Um, uh, what, the, what the panel? Uh, and I think uh, in many ways, uh, what we have discussed during uh, the conference yesterday um, can um, kind of feed into the discussion that we're going to have here today. Because what we have is that we have uh, academics, we have protect, uh, pra practitioners, and, and we also have people that are um, fighting within the system to change the system. So I think uh, most of you, well, I hope most of you will have watched the video online, uh, both from Jane and uh, from uh, Vrinta. Uh, so I think I am, but I'm still going to just follow the um, line that we have, uh, the, um, the alphabetic line uh, for them to speak. They're all going to uh, speak for 
five minutes-ish. Um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Uh, and uh, talk about uh, issues close to their hearts and, and uh, what they see relevant for revitalizing traditional justice systems in handling um, uh, gender-based violence. Uh, so I am going to start with Jane, uh, hand over to her. She uh, is going to talk to us about gender responsive policing um, and Jane, um, your talk was very insightful. Uh, I watched it online yesterday, and it was really great to see how the handbook from the UN that you have authored, how it um, addresses the many faces of policing, and how um, gender-responsive policing is not only important for the handling of cases, but also for building trust. Uh, and um, the way that police is perceived in the community. So uh, please, Jane, if, if you will uh, start, of us, start us off with, with the discussion about gender responsive policing. Okay, um, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to this uh, esteemed uh, event. Um, if you start me off talking about gender responsive policing, five minutes is never enough, so I'll try <laughs> to be brief. Um, I wear two hats at this event, so I'm representing UN Women um, and the uh, development of the handbook, but I'm also the executive director of the International Association of Women Police. And as former president of that organisation, um, I spent six years advocating for gender responsive policing. And uh, many um, people assume gender responsive policing is just about women. Um, it is not. It is about ensuring that police institutions in their service delivery consider the needs of uh, women and girls and men and boys and make sure that um, the service that are provided um, are equal in nature so that they don't focus more on male crimes uh, and that sort of thing. It also... Uh, it, and, uh, it requires that the police organisations themselves look inward and ensure that barriers to uh, recruitment, retention and progression for women within the service are removed, that um, the culture within policing is inclusive. And we know um, from research, even my own research, that when female officers are visible in uniform, on the streets, uh, community trust and confidence goes up. And certainly within um, the uh, women and girls uh, uh, aspect of the community, and certainly those in marginalized and minority groups, their trust and confidence rises significantly. Um, we only have to, and I, I cite it regularly, actually, it's a few years ago now, and many of you have probably already heard the example, um, but when an all, I believe it was Indian, um, forward res uh, policing response unit um, through the UN mission was sent to Liberia. Um, the number of applications for females within the Liberian community to become police officers rose by about 300%. And that's just by seeing other women in a uniform. So what gender resp responsive policing is not about, it's not about pigeonholing women into roles that only deal with women and children. It's about making sure that everybody has the same opportunities and that we recognize too, that men also have a role to play in um, providing services to, to victims and survivors of um, gender-based violence and all crimes. Um, so um, um, the International Association of Women Police have partnered with UN Women and UNODC. Now we're at the uh, rollout and implementation of the handbook, but we are encouraging uh, police chiefs and associations across the globe to s sign and pledge to five commitments that we've developed on implementing gender responsive policing. I didn't time that, so I'm not sure, but I've no doubt it was five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. And I think uh, uh, 
what you have said here about understanding the police uh, and the role of women within the police as a holistic matter, not seeing female police officers have to deal with uh, female yeah. matters, but that the police is gender responsive in all of their actions. And um, um, our next speaker can talk about how important that is and when that fails, uh, that uh, is not uh, very good. Uh, but an another speaker later here, Sigrid Björk, she will tell us about um, gender responsive policing in, in, in action. But our next speaker is Maria Sjöp. Um, and um, yes, I, I think uh, you will maybe um, introduce yourself, but, but she has a very um, important uh, story to tell for this context. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Árnadóttir, and I am a victim of and survivor of domestic violence. I'm also a victim of violation by the justice system in Iceland, namely during police investigation of the crimes as I was subjected to be my former spouse. I pressed charges for domestic violence, mental and physical abuse, two attacks and a threat in December 2017. Before I pressed charges, I went to the police in January 2017 to get the case on record. When my abuser heard of that, he threatened to send the inappropriate pictures of me to my supervisors at work. In short version, I received a degrading treatment by the half of the police throughout the whole process of my case. The police dropped the case both attacks lapsed in their hand of the police. I requested reasoning for the missile because the case had good evidence. But such reasoning was not provided. This is a clear violation of the Iceland Criminal Act and the Ad Administrative Act with both obliged the police to provide such reasoning upon request within 14 days. I also requested a copy of my files, which the police are obliged to deliver by law, but they denied. It wasn't until I sent a personal letter to the prosecution authority to complain about this, but no legal provision provided such a right. I first got the case files two months after I originally requested the documents, which was long after I had submitted to appeal to prosecution authority of the decision to dismiss the case. This meant I had no files and company the appeal letter. When I pressed charges, I provided the police with information of witnesses that could confirm case facts and the attacks. I informed the police about where I had sought assistance following the attacks. This including, included information from doctors regarding physical injuries. I provided pictures of the injuries information from victim support centers, Bjarkahlid and Stigamot. I also provided information of my abuser having sought counseling for his viol violent behavior. Furthermore, I provided the police proof in form of screenshot of communication where the abuser apologized inflicting the injuries. Despite of all this tangible evidence, it became clear to me that very little was be done in the investigation when the statement had not been taken from the abuser seven months after the press charges, when the police asked me for the abuser's phone number, which was already in the files. This was not the first or last time I got phone call from the police about the abuser's phone number. I knew something was wrong in my case, but I had no right to see the case file since, since the law does not provide victims with access to investigation documents. In my opinion, there's a lack of legal provision to complain about delays in investigation to higher authority. Before the case and the submitted charges become time barred, barred. I was concerned about the risk of time lapse, so I emailed and I called many times to the police about my concern, but that was brushed off. So I tried to trust the investigators. According to case files, 
a statement from abuser was not taken until eight months after a press charges. A statement of the accused marks the launch of an investigation under Icelandic law and as such stops the time lapse of the offence. On that day, 27th August 2018, both attacks by Mabuse were time lapsed, as more than two years have been passed from the time of each offence. It, it also became clear that the police were not collecting proof of medical and physical psychological effects and the only proof of effects from attacks are communi communication notes from a doctor that I provided when I pressed charges. The police overlooked most of the evidence that I have provided them with in it with included a list of witnesses for each offense and their contact information. Witnesses were also contacted late, if at all. Two witnesses were first contacted contacted 10 months after I pressed charges and three witnesses 15 months after I pressed charges. When, discuss, when discussing this with the investigation, it became clear to me that the police had not gone through the evidence that I had provided them. After a year and a half of a lim, limited investigation, I was informed by a letter that the police decided to dismiss my case on the basis that the case was not likely to lead to a conviction. No further reasoning was provided by the police. I requested reasoning for dismissal because the case had really good evidence, but such reasoning was never provided. I first, yeah. I first got the case for two months after I originally requested documents with was a long after I have submitted it to the appeal. In late summer 2019, the prosecution authority concluded that the real reason behind the dismissal was due to the fact a police had failed to start investigating the case before it lapsed. That was the first time that I and my lawyer had knowledge of this casing having been barred. Not only did the prosecution authority reach the conclusion that the police let the case lapsed, but also concluded that the statement that gave police when a press justice was supported by evidence. The prosecution authority inter alia mentioned it, that fact that I have provided a list of witnesses that were, up, that were able to testify about the tax, as well as pictures of my injuries and screenshots of communi communication between I and my abuser at the time of the attacks supporting that I was being abused to me, he was being abused to me. The prosecution authority made it note that it did not agree with the police assumption that my descriptions or events were unclear. It was clear now that the police decision to drop my case was not based on any real investigation on behalf of the police, but was merely a, an excuse to try to cover up for the fact that they had let my case lapse right in front of them. Despite me having contacted them various times after I pressed charges of the status of the case, by failing to officially start the investigation within time frame prescribed by law, the police ultimately deprived my, me of my chance to have my abuser held accountable for his action, as was I deprived of my rights to a fair trial. Only one offence out of many was not time barred at the point in time a threat by my abuser. The prosecution authority proposed to the police to indict for the threat. In short, my abuser was convicted for threatening me in July 2020 by the district court. My abuser appealed to the case to the appeals court, but today no date has been set for case pleadings now that part of the criminal case is therefore still pending in the court system, now five years after I suffered his violence. My case shows, in my opinions, that women overall are the weaker position in Icelandic justice system, and the state continuously discriminates women with the treatment of accusation made by them by not conducting effective or practical investigation of domestic violation and mental abuse by spouses. 
thank you so much for sharing and um, thank you for taking the step to be here with us. I'm sure this is not easy and, and just thank you. It's very really good for us, so thank you for inviting me. Great. Um, because I, one of the things that I think is very important about the conversation that we're having here at the Reykjavik Dialogue is that we are able to bring together so many different voices in the same platform uh, that all um, kind of shine different lights on the issues, um, but they all kind of highlight the same thing, uh, that gender-based violence uh, even with the efforts that have been made, uh, we haven't progressed far enough. Uh, and it's, um, I, wished, I wished that your case had been handled better. Um, and I, I am sure that we will um, discuss this um, more. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned was uh, the threat to share your intimate uh, content. Um, and our next speaker, Marianne Franks, of course, is one of the world leaders uh, in the field of um, sexual privacy, protecting sexual privacy. Um, and, um, and I know that because she is one of the um, academics that I refer most in my doctoral thesis on the topic. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Marianne Franks to, to speak. Thank you very much. My name is Marianne Franks. I'm a law professor in the University of Miami in the United States. And I also am the president of a nonprofit organization called the Cyber Civil Rights um, Initiative. And as was just mentioned, our focus at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative is on the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, which can very often, of course, be a part of domestic violence. It can also be a part of a stranger interaction. It can be the product of someone uh, filming you without your knowledge or your consent. It can happen essentially to anyone and by anyone. And my experience primarily is based in the United States, but what I wanted to speak to, especially in these introductory remarks, are things that I think are globally relevant. And those things have a lot to do with the story that you just told, which is that the law in so many ways is very much based on the due process of the accused offender as opposed to the survivor or the target. And in my own work as an academic and also as an activist, I'm often trying to import the concept that I'm sure some of you are familiar with in this room from the humanitarian um, work, the concept of the last girl. The idea that if we're thinking about a policy or we're thinking about some kind of change to a society, that we should be asking ourselves, who is the most vulnerable person in the society? How will this change or this policy affect that person? And in my work, I argue that law, very generally speaking, but especially the criminal law in the United States, and especially the free speech law in the United States, which unfortunately has been, I think, exported um, to a lot of the world through the internet, that it is very androcentric. It is based on the notion that the victim and the perpetrator are male, that the kinds of harms that men tend to think of as being important are the things that get encoded, <laughs> that the whole idea behind the criminal law trying to articulate or to conceptualize a harm to the community as opposed to an individual tends to think of harms that mostly men are concerned with. And that I would like to push the law in the United States and elsewhere to think of it as the law for the last girl. To think about what do we need for criminal law to serve the purposes of the most vulnerable person in society. What would our laws on free speech and on the internet look like if we were focused on the most vulnerable as opposed to the most powerful people in society? So at my organization, we focus on this concept of non-consensual pornography, as we call it, sometimes called revenge porn. Claire McGlynn, who spoke yesterday, I think has termed it uh, image-based sexual abuse. We try to emphasize that this is not a new crime in certain ways, because this idea of treating especially women's bodies as public property is not something new, but because technology has advanced, there are new ways of doing it and ways of distributing it that are um, somewhat of a challenge for the modern era. In the United States, of course we have 50 states, 
When we started our work in 2013, sorry, 2013, 2014, there were only three states that had any laws that regulated the, not, the distribution of intimate imagery. Today, based partly on our work, there are 48 states, and there is a federal law that has been introduced in the House of Representatives and is awaiting vote in the Senate. There are things that I'd love to discuss in the Q&A about how we got there, but a huge part of our initiative is to try to lay claim to the criminal law and to say the harms that happen to women disproportionately, especially those harms that are inflicted upon them disproportionately by men, should be at the center of our criminal law. We need to harness the power of the criminal law, not because we are um, excited or, or completely uh, unambivalent about carceral penalties, but because we believe in the power of deterrence. What we want to emphasize to our community is to have people not do this at all. We don't want to put people in jail for doing this. We want them to understand this is a harm that you would inflict on society, and so you should not do it at all. Our initiative conducted an empirical survey that not just asked victims about their experiences, but asked perpetrators about theirs. And one of the questions we asked them was, what, if anything, would have stopped you from engaging in this kind of behavior? And overwhelmingly, the response was, if I thought that I could go to jail for it. So if this is something that we know, that people do take seriously the notion that the law tells you what is serious, the law tells you what is worthy of punishment, then we need to lay claim to that and say this is something that matters so that we can deter this abuse before it ever begins. And we do the same thing likewise in the, the context of what our organization's name indicates, which is cyber civil rights. That every uh, possible harm almost today can be exacerbated, can be made worse by the internet and by technology. And that these are things the law needs to catch up to. Our organization is survivor focused in that we are trying to push on all the possible levers to get reform. We want to talk about legal change, but we also want to talk about technological change, and we also want to talk about social change. But all of those things we think begin by having a statement in the law that emphasizes that sexual crimes, that intimate crimes, that privacy is an essential part of free speech, that for women to be able to express themselves freely and not live in fear, they have got to have their interests counted. And therefore, whatever law we are looking at, whether it is the law of the crimes in various states, whether it is how technology companies need to respond to abuse on their platforms, whether it's talking about the values of free speech, all of this needs to be oriented towards the most vulnerable in society, those who have been silenced and excluded throughout history, and we need to put them first at the heart of the law, at the heart of technology, and at the heart of social reform. Thank you. Um, yes, I agree. <laughs> um, and I think also, I'd like to talk about the importance of the law and, and how that looks. And, and our next speaker, Seyri Björk Guðjónsdóttir, she's going to talk about the enforcement of the law, um, the importance of um, uh, the police applying themselves um, in, in, uh, in the issues that we're talking about. Um, I will give the floor to you, Sirius. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start by thanking, my, thanking the other panelists, especially uh, for the story of the survivor. And uh, I'd also like to express my apologies for uh, the... Uh, harm that she received by our system. And I want to tell you about our journey. Uh, my journey in the police started in 2002. And uh, then uh, the victims were not considered part of our system. When they called and asked for uh, information, they were disturbing us. Uh, the, the same was with re reporters, etc. So we have been evolving from being a power organization to a service organization. And uh, we are adopting a victim oriented approach. And the journey started in uh, 2011, where we had uh, new laws about expulsion and uh, and uh, expulsion from home, and uh, they were the laws were not um, followed. It seemed that nobody knew that they were there. 
So we start, had to start by educating our people and also just to do things differently. And we had to listen to our clients. And we started looking at our cases and we saw that almost none of them went to court in domestic violence. Almost none. So we had to analyze why are they not going to court? So we uh, developed a new method by uh, cooperating with the, um, with the uh, municipalities where we tried to support the victims and also to investigate uh, faster, go to the scene and investigate fully while the circle of violation, uh, circle of violence had not moved on. So in short, it was not new money or, uh, or new uh, investigative uh, methods that we were prescribed. We just decided to do things better and to try and look at it from the viewpoint of our client. And we did this in the Sudanese district uh, at the airport. And then we moved to the capital where we started to change the capital also from the January 2015. And in 2016, there was a, a huge number of cases. And the cases kept uh, increasing. And it was not very, it was not a simple task because it also had to do with the culture of the police and the culture of the society where domestic violence was not discussed. And we have learned a lot on this journey and we have tried to lower the threshold for, to make it easier for victims to come to us. We have tried to educate our people and make domestic violence uh, be seen as a priority and, all, and as also as sexual, sexual violence as well. We have been part of uh, putting up a family justice center where we are uh, partners. We partnered up with NGOs. We are also now part of uh, 112.is, which is a new portal where you can have all kinds of information and stories of survivors, like we heard before, that has impact on those who are living in, in a violent uh, relationship and need the push to get out and need to believe that we can do better. Uh, we see that we have many cases, much more cases that go to court now, but still it's a lot of cases. And as you heard before, we can do better. So we have evolved, developed a business intel where we look at the cases very closely and try to watch out for them not to fall through the crack. So we can see the time length of the investigations. And uh, yes, so we have a, the overview that was not before. It's like in any other business, we can see the supplies of cases that we have and are trying to work harder on, uh, on getting more cases to court and processing them more professionally, just also by educating our people. There has to be an emphasis from top down. It cannot happen any other way. And we have to listen outside in, not inside out, not what we want to do for our clients. We need to listen to our clients what they want us to do. So that is the biggest change. And what I am maybe most proud of is the new site access to the police system where sufferers of uh, vict victims of, uh, of rape and sexual crimes can access their case through the system. They can see not all the files, but they can see uh, the, that the, who, where the case is, approximately the length of time it takes to investigate it and at what phase it is in the system. So you don't have to call, you don't have to sit at home and wait for the letter that comes maybe in a year. And we are also trying to shorten the time in time frame in these matters. We have been making uh, legal changes. We have a minister that has been doing uh, quite uh, uh, good things about uh, uh, yeah, about this area. Yeah. So I think that we are on the right track, but we are not there yet. And we want to do better. And we can only do it better by listening and by cooperating and also to enforce by hand that actually the rules and the laws are followed in every case. 
Thank you very much. Um, and for context, it perhaps would have been better to remind everyone that Seyrid Björk is the National Commissioner for Police in, in Iceland. So the organization that she talks about moving from a power organization to a service organization is the police. So, um, and, I, and I think it's important what you say about top down that, uh, that cultural change that you have been, and I, and I think it's fair to say that it is you um, uh, that has um, enforced that cultural change on, on the police. Um, and it's a good reminder of how important it is who, who sits in the chairs. So the system isn't only um, a nameless system, it is also the people that work for the system. Um, and I think, uh, Maria, you uh, wanted to say a few, few words. Sirio Björk, I want to thank you for apologizing for the behalf of the police for the treatment I got. This is the first time I got apologies. Thank you. Well, that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that that that's great. Um, great. It's good to hear. Um, we are going to move on to Sweden uh, to uh, Stina Holberg. And um, she has uh, conducted a research uh, on the new um, rape clause in the Swedish legislation. And I think what will be important to hear from her is, um, just as, uh, as the commissioner has said, uh, Maria, uh, Marianne and Jane so far, is the importance of the law and the application of the law um, going together. So, uh, please, Tina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. My name, as Maria said, is Tina Holmberg, and I'm a senior researcher at, at the National Council for Crime Prevention in Stockholm. And uh, uh, I've made a review of the implementation of the new consent law concerning rape in Sweden that was introduced in 2018. And our overall picture is that the law change has functioned well, both when it comes to legal efficiency and legal security. The law change has also led to that the number of, of convictions has increased by 75%, but you must remember that that was from a low level. <laughs> so my view is that introducing a consent law is a good step to take. The primary gain is that it gives a clear social signal that all sexual acts require consent from both parts. It is important that this legal message is spread through many channels and school has a central role to play in this connection. And I am hopeful that this will have an effect when it comes to preventing rape. But I also think that we have to remember that even with the consent law, most reported cases will not lead to a rape conviction. In Sweden, it is still only 10% of the reports that lead to a rape conviction. In 90% of the cases, they are not convicted, the perpetrator is not convicted. And in some of these cases, it's due to bad work from the police and the prosecutors, as was described so well earlier here. But I don't think that even if the work by the police improves, that we will see a dramatic increase in rape convictions. We, the National Council has just evaluated the work of a new specialized unit for investigation of sex crimes uh, outside Stockholm, a unit that has got lots of extra resources and good competence. And everyone was very content with their work, but conviction rates 
were about the same as in other parts of Sweden. So it didn't have a strong effect of the convic uh, over the conviction rate. So I think it is necessary to analyze further what is the most important for the victims of rape to heal, even if it is not possible to increase the conviction rate. It is possible to develop and improve other means that may help the victim to heal. This means it may include the work of the legal system, of course, but also involve other actors. So I think that, uh, that must uh, also be discussed apart from how the legal system can be improved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The interaction of the um, legal system or the criminal justice system with other systems within society. Our next two speakers um, are both uh, lawyers uh, and are um, fighting the good fight within the uh, criminal justice system. Um, uh, first, Vietis is going to take the floor, and then uh, Vrinta. So, Vietis, please. Thank you. Um, as an attorney uh, working within the realm of the criminal law system and the human rights system, um, one sometimes gets the interesting job of safeguarding the, the interests of a victim of domestic violence, mental or physical abuse, or sexual assault. Um, one example being Maria, uh, sitting next to me also, uh, a client of my firm. Um, during this process, both um, me as an attorney and my client um, as the victim encounter still today several issues, both within the law itself, but also with the practice and the procedures procedures with the police when investigating and prosecuting um, crimes that have been mentioned here today. Um, I can describe some of these obstacles or encounters that we face on a daily basis. Um, one being, um, for example, um, the question of whether a victim has a right to a legal representative funded by the state to represent um, them during an investigation and hopefully later um, before the courts. Um, in my experience, there is this awkward moment sometimes um, where the attorney has to have a dialogue or, or a very firm discussion with the police or whether the client actually has this right. Um, I have experienced this uh, particularly in, in cases of clients that are not Icelandic, that are foreign, uh, perhaps based somewhere else uh, in a neighboring country, um, and they are not familiar with the system. They are not sure how to press charges. They don't speak the, the language. This is also sometimes true for um, victims that are underage, children. Uh, their parents perhaps can, uh, have a have a dialogue with a lawyer before they actually press charges. Um, and the staff itself just entering a police station and pressing charges against your abuser that is perhaps your spouse or a relative or, or, or someone that you are close with um, is huge. And having to consider also, can I afford to press these charges? Because um, it might end up, and it did in Maria's case, um, having the result that you are financially burdened by the decision to try to actually um, see your abuser uh, being convicted or held accountable in the justice system. And also what you mentioned here earlier, that uh, in this time and age where the crimes are taking another form on the internet, harassment on the internet, uh, revenge pornography and such, these are often crimes that um, police officers today are not as familiarized with as, as um, the more normal crimes that we have had for ages. Um, and having this dialogue with the police is, in my opinion, unnecessary and shouldn't be uh, 
of, uh, like afforded by the law. Uh, there should be this rule um, where victims that are wish to press charges have a right to a state-funded legal representative for the first steps in the case. I think this is an important reform that needs to be done. Um, and as has also been stated by various speakers here today, um, the criminal law is not victim-oriented. It is oriented and based on the premise that the accused cannot be held accountable and must, of course, uh, be considered innocent until proven guilty. Um, but why does this premise of the accused person um, enjoying uh, his or her human right, uh, why does this exclude the opportuni opportunity to offer a victim some substantive rights at the outset of a criminal case investigation? Um, um, and I think just to mention a practical example or a few practical examples, um, briefly mentioned by Maria, a victim under Icelandic criminal law is not a party to the, the criminal case. Um, the law offers a very ambiguous uh, right that is um, alike the right of a bystander, or um, if you're watching a football game, the game is happening on the field, but you are sitting in, in a, um, a, a way looking at the game. And uh, in, in my experience, um, an attorney needs to form a strong professional bond with particular police officers um, to be able to receive some information or more information because sadly, today, our reality is that our calls and our emails are often considered a disturbance still today that we are requesting information about the status of the case, has the accused been brought in for questioning? Have you contacted witnesses? Have you contacted the doctor that did a physical? Uh, have you contacted the hotline for victims um, or other victim support groups such as Stigamot? Um, we do not have a right to this information, but having a strong professional bond with particular offers can help. It can mean that they are more likely to answer your emails or more likely to answer your calls. Um, and this is not a guarantee for a victim. Um, a victim can be lucky to have an attorney that has this experience in the field and is therefore more likely to, to safeguard its interests diligently and in good cooperation with the police. But this vacuum is, is, is intolerable, in my opinion. Um, and this question arises, what happens when criminal investigations end or are finalized? Um, and most often, the reality is that they, they end with a case being dismissed by the police. Uh, a, a small minority of cases are actually prosecuted, despite, in my opinion, many of the cases having strong, tangible evidence as to the guilt of the perpetrator. Um, so, I think the numbers are that 17% of, of cases that have been reported to the police actually end with a, uh, or f are continued to the prosecution stage and uh, where an indictment is issued. Um, and a lesser number of that ends in a conviction before the courts. Um, so, us lawyers, what can we do to make a difference? And my, my colleagues and a team of experts at my law firm, Rietur, um, we have specialized in human rights cases and we have specialized in women's rights. And as a response to this system that we consider having the systematic fault of not including victims in investigating criminal cases, um, we decided in cooperation with Stigamot, the victim support group here in Iceland, to lodge uh, a strain of cases to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, claiming that the widespread, widespread practice of the Icelandic authorities uh, dismissing charges of domestic violence, sexual assault, all these uh, women-victim-based women uh, offenses, um, 
we claim that these cases, despite all the strong evidence that sometimes uh, are provided in these cases by the victims themselves, uh, but still dismissed, we consider that the dismissal and the systematic fault um, involves a violation of the Icelandic state's positive burden to protect women as victims um, from violence. And also, this is a violation of their right to a fair trial, such as Maria said, because victims are seldomly um, uh, a part of the, the justice system in the form of, the, of court proceedings. Um, and this is also a violation of their rights um, of having effective remedies in place, in the law or in practice, uh, with police procedures um, to protect them from violence in their homes and in their private life. Um, so we have around nine cases now that are pending before the European Court in, in Strasbourg, uh, where uh, we are at the stage that the Icelandic state has received some questions from the court. Um, about whether or not the state considers these practices to be in line with human rights of, of women and victims of, of violence. So um, I hope to be able to share more information about these cases with you here later today. Great, thank you very much. Um, and just to kind of add for context for those that are not Icelandic natives, um, the European Court of Human Rights has actually been quite instrumental in updating uh, or assisting the Icelandic state to update systematic issues. So, for example, um, what, 30, 40 years ago, um, a, a case from the European Court of Human Rights had a massive impact on the way that um, kind of courts in the um, rural areas of Iceland were organised. So, this isn't... Um, uh, even though this is a very innovative way of uh, using the law to um, kind of uh, provoke a change in the law, um, that uh, if that will be successful, that wouldn't be unique uh, in Icelandic legal history. Um, but finally, uh, we are having um, some remarks from Vrinta. Um, she is speaking to us from India, um, and um, where she also, like Vietis, is a practicing attorney uh, focusing on women's rights. So please, Renta. Thank you. And it's indeed, um, I'm, I'm very happy to be on this panel, and I think it's, uh, I, I'm glad I'm the last for this round of speaking because there are a lot of things that I've heard. Uh, which have also provoked fresh ideas in my mind. And I really look forward to hearing how the proceedings before the European Court finally culminates. I also want to add that the interaction that we were privileged to see between the survivor who had suffered at the hands of the legal system and the police officer actually also gives us a glimpse into what are the ways forward when we ask, you know, in, in this... Uh, the term justice and what does it mean and what are people seeking from the, from the state and the system. So thank you for that. Um, I will, uh, so there are some, some provocations from some of the panelists that if I may also uh, talk a little bit about. I would like to look at this as a process of engendering due process rather than abandoning or uh, uh, changing due process. Uh, and the place where I come from to say this is that I, I practice as much as um, a feminist lawyer appearing on behalf of victims of and survivors of a range of gender-based violence, as well as a criminal defense attorney for a range of human rights defenders who are targeted by the state. And so for me, these rights are not in collision with each other. I don't see the legal system as necessarily pitting the rights of the victim and the accused. I also don't see these as frozen categories. I see these as interchangeable categories. Because when I ask myself, 
who is the woman we are talking about here? Is it a woman who is the leader of the indigenous people's movement, who has been picked up by the security forces on charges of having led a march to the police station? What are her rights within the police station where she's likely to suffer? And these are, I'm talking from actual incidents and clients I have represented, sexualized torture at the police station, which he's targeted with. So I, you know, when one is representing her, what is the gamut of rights that she must, that must be available to her? And therefore, I would not like to see this as an accused versus victim situation. I think there are uh, fair trial rights and there are due process rights. And I personally believe from my experience in India that nobody can be more uh, invested in due process and rule of law than women as a constituency. And the reason I would say that is actually abundant. We are talking in the backdrop of watching what is happening in Afghanistan, where rule of law may suddenly have been thrown completely to the winds. What, what is it that those women are going to engage with? What is it they are going to negotiate with? And therefore, I, I firmly believe that women as a class are deeply invested in ensuring rule of law. Undeniably, that rule of law requires to be engendered. Let me take one example which came to the forefront, and it may seem trivial, but has affected lives of many women across the world, I would believe. And the Me Too movement threw this upon us. Women came forward to complain of sexual harassment after decades, because one woman spoke up against a powerful man, and this didn't happen only in the US and other parts, it happened in India. And this particular person, the, the man I'm talking about, he passed away two years ago, but he was heading a very powerful UN committee and was an, a very powerful uh, uh, man globally as well as within India, running an educational center, NGO, etc. When one young woman working under him complained, we had women coming out who had worked in a subordinate position 20, 30 years ago. The challenge that it threw to the law was the law of limitation. How can these complaints be accepted? Can they be believed? Why have they kept quiet for so long? Our law has no answers for these because the law would like to believe that if you are late in reporting a crime, that means you are lying. That means you are improving your statement. It means you are embellishing your statement. I believe that these understandings of law have actually been secured from the uh, lived experience of men rather than the way power operates between uh, on the axis of gender. And those are the elements that I would like to believe we need to incorporate. So I think, for instance, the statute of limitation may require to be revisited, particularly in the context of a severe power imbalance. And unless that power imbalance is somehow diminished, women are not going to place their lives, their jobs, their employment, everything at risk. The other issue, for instance, that would come forward here uh, is, and which I think in India at least, particularly all of South Asia is besieged with. We have in India, a lot of reforms in statutory law. And yet the conviction rate remains uh, very low. And yet we see women being extremely hesitant and reluctant to going through the entire process. We have seen a, a very sharp rise in number of women who are reporting cli uh, crimes, uh, particularly sexual offenses. And I think that change has come about because more women are uh, not accepting this as their fault. However, the process remains very harsh. It remains extremely insensitive, and therefore many of them drop during the pros legal process, and their conviction rates remain low. One reason for that is the inherent bias and the perpetuation of stereotypes. How do you understand a woman who is out late in the evening? How do you understand day trade? Invariably, uh, it is the bias, it is the prejudice that is influencing the investigator, 
the, uh, the almost ineffective prosecution, but definitely the mind of the court. And this has reached such a point that we've now had the Supreme Court of India this year actually lay down guidelines that you will not consider women to be weak. You will not think that a woman cannot take decisions for herself. I mean, you're, imagine in 2021, the highest court of the land has to script this for the subordinate judiciary because these biases are what are undermining uh, women's access as well as eventual right to justice. And I think here there really remains a lot of work to be done because perhaps at the center of it remains, is the violence done to women? Is it a harm? Is it a crime? And to my mind, that question remains an open question in many societies, definitely in South Asian societies, because uh, uh, religious sanctions, cultural practices do not consider domestic violence, etc., to be uh, necessarily crimes. In India, we saw that when we brought in a civil law, civil remedies giving right to residents, protection orders against domestic violence, many, many more women actually access civil remedies rather than the criminal law, which they found was not giving them the kind of relief that they wanted because putting the man in jail, when you are in a poor family and you need to then get bread on the table, may not necessarily be what that woman is looking for. The civil law on domestic violence opened the floodgates and actually showed us what really was the underbelly of this undocumented uh, domestic violence that was taking place in India. I will, uh, for this round, just quickly wind up, therefore, uh, by just adding one particular element, because we did see, um, we heard a little bit around privacy and online. And I think what we need to remember uh, is that online spaces have become the new areas of violence against women, particularly sexual violence. And it is here that, can I be heard or is it frozen, the internet? We hear you loud and clear. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think, uh, so on the online aspect, uh, what I want to only add here, that we see that women who are being targeted young women who are being targeted with a lot of uh, uh, rape threats, etc. Uh, they're not just targeting women, but it is particularly women who are politically articulate and active and perhaps challenging dominant hegemonic narratives in their particular jurisdiction. So here again, uh, we need to also take into account how journalists, etc., are particularly vulnerable to this kind of online uh, sexual harassment and, and threats of sexual violence uh, to which uh, we don't really see any um, accountability being created, although I would imagine uh, that technologically these should be easier to uh, unscramble by the investigating agency, but we don't actually see those results coming in. And I will stop there for now. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I wrote down... Um, uh, while you were speaking, um, and patriarchy, uh, and, and maybe that's kind of uh, when we think about what what kind of is common in what everyone has has spoken about here is the underlying social norms uh, that shape uh, the judicial system, both the law, the police institutions, and the application of the law, um, and and. I will speak from a personal experience as a lawyer. I went through five years of legal education in the uh, country that tops the list of any of all the measures on, on gender equality, and I never ever learned anything about feminist law. I didn't learn about Catherine McKinnon until I was an adult and after I graduated law school. Um, and, and I think maybe there's also something about uh, the kind of traditional uh, and conservative um, element and notion about the law that makes it such a, 
such a drag <laughs> in, in the context. Um, but I wanted to, at least what I've summed up here is, is one, it's the law and its application. Another is the police as an institution and their investigation. And I thought as um, discussed by Vrenta also as a possible uh, uh, violator of rights. Uh, and then the patriarchal foundations of society that I think we can all agree that we need to smash. Um, so maybe if, if, I, uh, if there is anyone that uh, would like to um, start off, we have had two questions here on the Slido, and I, I want to encourage everyone uh, watching and, and present to uh, use the slide of the questions. Um, and they both, uh, the, the questions that we have had in are both very kind of uh, focused uh, on, on what we have discussed about the functioning both of the law and of the police. Um, so I will maybe then um, uh, start off with, as, as we talk about the police as an institution and uh, enforcer of the law, um, what uh, kind of what else can we do? We heard about Sigrid Björk and, and the Icelandic police here having changed their protocols, but we've also heard that maybe that isn't enough. Uh, and we talked about uh, the gender responsive policing. And, and Jane, I see you have your hand up. You, you are welcome to uh, take over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yes, I made uh, a lot of notes uh, during other people's talking and I was particularly struck by um, the frankness and bravery really of Maria to tell her story. Um, and as a uh, former police officer myself and having worked, doing a lot of work, certainly training police in gender-based violence, you know, it, it was so sad to hear, but I wasn't surprised. Um, maybe more surprised it, it happening in Iceland, <laughs> but um, it is, you know, it, it happens everywhere, including where I'm from, the UK. So um, the, the police organisations in the past, I mean, part of the reason for bringing in the handbook is actually to target um, the, the police themselves. So middle managers, so um, police station commanders and those first responders. Um, many forces have specialists, you know, they've developed specialist units, but it's actually that first point of contact that is going to make the biggest impact on a victim or survivor. And, you know, there are several aims within the handbook, but a key one is that the, the victim survivor is there to, uh, to enable their meaningful participation in the investigation, which clearly Maria um, showed she did not have that opportunity uh, and many others don't. Um, and we're, we're also targeting for a uh, victim survivor centered approach, but a perpetrator focused investigation. Again, picking up on points that others have made. You know, we, we know, uh, I mean, I know personally and anecdotally from my work uh, with police services across the world is that um, they there's a lot of, you know, they focus on the credibility of the victim rather than the credibility of, of what the victim is complaining of. Um, and I used it, I'm actually here in Kosovo at the moment doing a gap analysis for implementation of the handbook. And I said to some officers this week, you know, why, if you are, if you attend a report for a burglary where someone has reported they've had their big television stolen, you don't get them to prove to you that they owned the television before you take the report. So why do we spend so much time trying to get a victim of gender-based violence almost proving that the offence has happened before the police take the report? So um, I, and I know our police commissioner that's here, we know that there's still a lot to do, and it goes back to my... Uh, earlier point that we have to make the police service more inclusive, 
more aware and ensure that those first responders are doing the right thing and that you know overall they are doing no harm we don't want to add to the victim survivors uh, but it it's going to take time and those of us who've been doing it a few years are going to keep going um, but it does take time um, but you know hopefully if we all work together and collaboration is key across the justice service then uh, and with communities then there will be a light at the end of the tunnel i'm convinced but it's not going to be short term sadly exactly processes don't change by themselves uh, just just like the law can i add to yes this, maria um, to what jane was saying um, i also think that um, of course i'm speaking from the viewpoint of the victim and its legal representative being an outsider during an investigation. But um, my feeling is that uh, we are missing the most important source of information when investigating crimes that are uh, directed at, at women as victims. Um, my experience is that the victim gives a testimony in the, in the early stages, at the outset of the investigations, later um, questioning of the accused, hopefully sometime uh, occurs. Um, but there is no further, the law doesn't describe any further dialogue with the victim. Um, there is no due process rule that some of, that some of the evidence um, uh, or some of the statements that the accused has given with the police, that they are confronted or discussed with the victim. So the victim isn't used as, as much as I think to give correct information and spot possible errors uh, before the investigation ends. Um, when an investigation has ended and a victim or its legal representative has the opportunity to challenge that decision and appeal to the prosecution authority or district commissioner, um, that is too late in my opinion. Um, that is the first platform where the victim and its legal representatives, rep representatives have to comment on the investigation and say, uh, well, they didn't check this, or they missed this important document, or they didn't speak to my psycho psychologist, or, or actually the counselor of my, my spouse, that, where he has confessed that he abused me several times. So I think that um, this is also one reform needed uh, within the law, um, making uh, a more proactive information right for the victim and also uh, that the victim is more considered as a part of the case, mm. a party that has uh, some meaning. Um, and I think that the, the experience of victims um, where with this high rate of dismissing cases of sexual assault and, and domestic violence is that women are not credible, women are not truthful, women are not important um, because um, the investigation was so uh, lacked so much practicality or efficiency. Um, so I think we should use, um, look to the origin and use victims more um, and their stories, uh, consider them credible and, and use that as a starting point for, for investigations. Mm, so the social norms and the biases against women kind of infuse mm -hmm. uh, the law and its application. Mm -hmm. um, I have the National Commissioner here. Thank you. It's very interesting and I have so much to say. Uh, I actually agree on the uh, lack of legal representation for the victims because you can get your you person that is, uh, you know, it's only about getting some um, money or damages, but not about protecting the rights of the victim for the whole time. So that definitely needs to be fixed. But uh, we have changed a lot in a positive way. For example, I was uh, starting on it before, that when we have now domestic violence, before we sent, when we had the disturbance or a call to the police, uh, police officers were sent to the scene and then uh, they sort of uh, uh, diffused the system, just diff diffused the situation, maybe took uh, the perpetrator out of the house, maybe not, and it was you know, a short visit. And then it went into an investigative uh, phase. And then the circle of violence had moved on. You know, we didn't get the witness uh, to speak freely. Evidence was uh, 
not secured, etc. So our approach is, in all cases now, that you don't have a choice. You have to go with investigators to the scene when it happens. You get maybe seven or eight people in your house in the middle of the night when it usually happens, most often in the weekends, we have the time frame, and they investigate fully on scene. They take the, uh, take the witness statements on the scene. They take the pictures on scene. They even uh, secure evidence on scene. And there comes uh, a person from uh, the municipalities, a social worker, that supports the victim, not only the children, a special uh, uh, person that supports the victim and uh, helps them to put to the police, not to the doctors. We have a follow-up visit. And what is more important and most important, because it's not enough to put the laws or the policy or even the rules on how to engage. You have to actively, actively watch over it. So what we do is that we go over each and every case and see if it was processed correctly. And if it's not, we go back and try to fix it. And the other thing that is also important is that now there is an investigative procedure that has to be followed to the law. Yeah, it has to be followed in every case. So you don't have a choice anymore because we have 10 or 15 cases coming in in the same night, maybe, okay, maybe um, I'm uh, excited a little, but a lot of cases that you could handle in a half an hour mo at most, as opposed to three to four hours of processing. You tend to choose the shorter version. So you cannot have that an option. So we can see when the disturbance cases start to increase, that's why the business intel is so important. And the domestic violence cases are uh, not coming in. Then we can see something is happening, something is wrong, we need to change the ratio. And also, I totally understand that the, the steps into the police station are really difficult. That's why we have adhered to it. We have trained our people to uh, receive people with a different, you don't have to stand there and state your business. Everything is done much more professionally and uh, victim oriented. And finally, uh, uh, about the report uh, from the victim, it has been debated, as the police officer can, uh, can uh, probably support us in. We are getting training here in Iceland from the UK, actually, from Manchester Police, in investigation technique. And what is so interesting in that is that before, you only took one uh, report from the uh, victim, because if the victim was called again and there were discrepancies in the stories, between uh, their uh, between the interviews, that could be used against the victim. But uh, recent uh, research shows that you don't remember everything. You know, you can't, there come different uh, information come to you when you maybe are in a shock and don't remember everything until later. So we are adhering to that as well. So we are following it closely and learning from our neighbors, but having said that, it is a journey and we are very far from uh, reaching the end of the road. We are continuously trying to better our efforts. I'm not saying this as a defense mechanism. I'm saying it because it is a priority for all of our people. And this is also a message to them. We are not quitting or saying, okay, we've done enough and just leaning back. That's not an option. We have to carry on again and continue until we have a system that our clients uh, feel is fair and work works really. So it's not uh, biased in any way. And we need also our uh, police force to uh, be uh, in, uh, okay, be like a society we serve. If we are serving 50% women, we need to have women in the police, not just 10% with no influence. So we have actively changed that by education, educating them. We went from 14% in, in 2014 up to almost 40% in 2020, which means that they actually have a voice and seeing women as role models, not just the police chiefs like myself who's a lawyer, 
uh, they want to see their own coming from inside the ranks. So we are actively working with the culture again and again and again, doing all kinds of, uh, of uh, training and also getting people from the outside, from the uh, ac academy, ac doing academia. Uh, yeah, academia, so. And then, okay. uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to stop you. Uh, but there's actually a question here from Feng Wan, uh, and, uh, and they ask if female, does female police officers increasing in numbers make any difference in terms of investigating sexual violence? And I think, uh, in a way, you, uh, you just answered that question, that it is important um, um, uh, for for the progress of uh, of such cases, if I may be um, take the opportunity because you mentioned academia and, and um, you, Marianne, uh, you of course have um, had tremendous impact on the legislation in the U.S. in in your field um, through, of course, merging academia and activism uh, through the um, civil rights. Uh, initiatives. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit about the way that um, uh, kind of activism can um, encourage uh, a better law and, and thus um, a better um, reality? Sure. And in my case, I had the great privilege of meeting um, a survivor of non-consensual pornography. She is the, the founder of our organization. Her name is Holly Jacobs. At the time that this happened to her, she was trying to finish her graduate dissertation. Um, this upended every aspect of her life. This, um, these images of her, very intimate images of her being distributed to her students, to her, uh, to her uh, employer. Um, when she came to me, because we happened to live in the same city, she came to me as an academic. She had read one of my articles where I had written about the problem of online abuse and how online abuse is something that the law is constantly being outpaced by, that it is not responsive enough. So she happened to read one of my articles, she asked for a meeting, and it was this extraordinary experience because she sat in front of me and she told me, I can't do my work. I can't, I'm having, I'm struggling in my current intimate relationship because of these photos. I am having a struggle with my family because my father, my brother, all these people have seen these photos of me that are the most intimate moments of my life. I can't go to the grocery store without wondering who else has seen my photos. There was no aspect of her life, whether it was professional, personal, any part of it, that wasn't affected by this. And it was making her not be able to work, to go to school, or to express herself. And when I'm having this conversation with her as an academic, I'm thinking, this is what I write about. I write about these problems, but I don't usually look at people and, and see them and hear them. And what she said to me was, I was told by every police officer, every lawyer, everyone I went to, that what happened to me is not a crime. The law does not recognize what happened to me as a crime. And she said to me, if that is true, then the law is wrong and it needs to be changed. Will you help me change it? And until she asked me this, I had never thought of myself as someone who would try to do legal reform. I teach law classes, right? People are forced to listen to me. I don't usually think of myself as someone who is going to take an active role in the law. But the more that she talked to me and the more I understood that she was taking on an extremely brave role, she was going to go public with her story. She was going to say, I am the face of this terrible crime, that what she was asking for me was for me to do my part of this, because I was a lawyer and I am a legal scholar, to do what she couldn't do, which is to come up with a law and say, this is what should be the law of every state. This is what should be the law of the United States. And I thought, if she can do what she's doing, the bravery that she was showing, her commitment to saying, I don't want what happened to me to happen to anyone else. Not just the experience of it, but being told by everyone I went to for help, this is not something the law recognizes. That should not be true. So as much as I didn't feel maybe qualified or prepared to do this, I thought this is at least something I can do for her. So we wrote a model law. I wrote a model statute, I posted it on the internet, and uh, I got a lot of feedback, um, we can go into that, but um, I got a lot of feedback, but I also started getting calls from legislators saying, we want to pass a law here, because I have a victim in my state who is saying, you should have a law against this revenge porn, non-consensual pornography. 
And that's where it started. We published the law on our website. We started talking to legislators in every state that wanted to pass it. And as I mentioned before, we went from three to 48 in the space of about six years. And we got a law introduced in the US Congress back in 2015 and then reintroduced several times. And then has been most recently reintroduced in the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2021. If it gets approved by the Senate, we will finally have a federal law in the United States that criminalizes this conduct. But along the way, the kinds of challenges and the kinds of challenges we are still facing come from individuals and organizations with a lot of power saying, you can't make this a crime. If you make this a crime, it's going to impinge upon free speech. Right? Naked pictures of another person are just free speech. If a person has given those photos to someone else, they should be allowed to do with them what they want. And that is coming from people who consider themselves to be defending human rights and civil rights. And so the battle that we have is not just against people who are saying, I want to defend revenge porn, but people who insist. Revenge porn is free speech. And if you try to change the law, you are just trying to punish people for doing something that's very understandable. So it has been very, very difficult in the last few years to try to get people to care. But we have had successes. And we have just tried to insist every time we get that kind of challenge to say, free speech isn't just for men. And free speech isn't just about the ability to share any information you want. It's about what happens to people when that kind of information is shared without their consent. How can you feel that you're comfortable being intimate with someone or trusting someone when you know that these kinds of things can come out against you? This happens to journalists, it happens to politicians, it happens to doctors. We have so many women and girls who are saying, I won't go into politics, I won't go into these professions because I'm afraid some ex-boyfriend out there is going to take these pictures and ruin my life. We now have technology that makes you look as though you are naked, even if you have never in your life taken a naked photo. You've probably heard about these digital impersonation technologies. Any person can be, there are whole applications and platforms that say, send me a picture of whoever you want, whatever woman in your life you want, and I will make a photo of her that looks like she is naked or having sex. Anyone in your life. Oddly enough, these applications don't work on men. <laughs> so it tells you something about the state of technology and where we need to be and where the law needs to be and how much challenge there is. A challenge against Google, against Facebook, against Twitter to have policies against this. All of whom finally said in 2015, after we were advocating for years, do something about this. You shouldn't have to wait for it to be a crime for you to take it off your platform. There is no reason for Facebook to keep this on the platform. They have no obligation to do so. There is no reason for Google to keep showing you results. What happened to the founder of our organization is that when you typed in her name to a search engine, all of her accomplishments went away. All of her personality went away. The only thing that showed up when you typed in her name into a Google search engine was pornographic link after pornographic link. That's what it reduced her to. And that is something that Google had the power to stop, and we finally got them to stop indexing some of those sites. But it is a constant challenge because we are constantly being told that we hate free speech, that we hate freedom of expression, that we're trying to make the, the, the world and the internet some very soft place where nobody ever gets hurt. And we have to keep insisting over and over again that women have the right to express themselves, women have the right to privacy, women have the right not to be turned into sexual entertainment without their consent. And we need to use the law to um, enforce that, not to kind of entrench the old social norms that kind of uh, clamp women into a, into a narrow box. Exactly, because we will see that in almost every legal system, it has been absolutely uncontroversial, as others were saying, compared to any other crime. No one tries to fight you over the idea that property theft is a crime. Mm -hmm. No one tries to argue that certain types of um, behavior in public is a crime. No one tries to say that, that defaming somebody should be completely protected by the law. And if you go back and you look, you can see that there are things we have always considered to be harmful and things that we consider to be outside of the law's scope. And the question is, why are we so often saying that the things that happen primarily to women, done disproportionately to them by men, why are those things so often out of scope when these other things are so firmly within the scope? Mm. Um, we have run out of time, but I'm going to steal just one minute to uh, ask a question that has come through Slido uh, regarding uh, Sweden and if the improved functioning of the police in Sweden did not result in increased convictions, uh, then surely we also need to look at the judicial process. Um, would you agree with that, Stina? Absolutely. I am uh, 
a couple of years ago, two years ago, I made a study that was called Rape from Report to Conviction. And that was a study where we, we went through all the legal material, material on 800 rape reports and studied exactly what happened to every report. What, we read all the material, what, uh, how long did it take, uh, how were the, what proof was taken in, and then we could, we analyzed the main reason for that most of the cases didn't lead to conviction. So I think these kinds of, of studies are important to better understand the, the in, in what way the police work and the prosecutors work must be, be improved. So I think that we need to, to, to find out where, where the, 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 the real means for improvement lie. Exactly. Thank you. Well, we have run out of time, and that was, of course, was going to happen with a panel like this. Uh, it was just, uh, w there was no escaping it, was it? Um, but I would like to thank our panelists for uh, their enlightening uh, talks, especially you, Maria, and for your bravery uh, for uh, sharing your story. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who is watching at home who is here and the organizers for facilitating uh, this conversation. And, and just like I said earlier, uh, the um, freedom in somehow having a survivor, the National Commissioner of Police, uh, world leading academics, uh, police uh, officers, uh, people working within the judicial system, all coming together. Um, and, and of course, with, ha with the help of technology. And I think this kind of approach of uh, merging academia, activism, and um, the practice of law must be the way forward, as, as um, I think has been demonstrated in this panel. Uh, so thank you very much for your time uh, and for your attention, and uh, I hope you have a continued good day. Thank you. Thank you all. I